in the prayer, I forgot to mention her in the, the announcements. She had a fall yesterday, actually knocked out a tooth, had to go to the ER. She did get home yesterday. She's at home now. She's just banged up and, 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 and bruised and, and whatnot. And so Brother Bob asked us to rem- remember her as well. So that is the last uh, prayer request that we have for the evening. Let's turn our attention to the life of Jesus. Now, we've only got five Wednesdays left in this study. I, I can't believe we're at the end of this study uh, through the life of Jesus. Last week, we examined the events that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, all the things that transpired in the lead-up to Jesus' arrest. Tonight and next week, we're transitioning to look at his trial. And we're going to look at it in two parts, because ultimately there are two phases to Jesus being on trial. I'm going to refer to them as the Jewish trial and the Roman trial. Tonight we will focus solely on the Jewish part of his trials. And the the divide, the basis of the divide between Jewish and Roman trials is essentially who's in charge of the uh, interrogation or who's in charge of the examination, who's in charge of the line of questioning, who's in charge of that portion of Jesus's... uh, trial. And there's a significant section where it's the high priests and the Sanhedrin who are doing all of the examination of Jesus. Later it becomes Pilate and and Herod and um, the soldiers get involved. So we're dividing it that way. Tonight we're going to focus on the events that happen just as Jesus is appearing in uh, Jewish settings of, of being on trial. And we're going to have a pretty, a pretty good-sized reading here. Once again, our reading is going to be a compilation of all four Gospels. Instead of reading the four different accounts, we're squeezing them together uh, and, and eliminating the things that overlap a lot and focusing on the, the, the details that stand out in each text and making them mesh together. And so you'll see the color coding that goes with the book and chapter. The verses there uh, relate as well. So... Let's read tonight. We will be starting with John's gospel and transitioning through the others. So the, excuse me, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door, and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a a charcoal fire because it was cold. And they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about the disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in, the synagogue, in, in synagogues and in the temple, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, and of the chief priests and elders and scribes, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Now the chief priests 
and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put them to death, to put him to death. But they found none, for many bear false witness against him. I'm really having trouble with the colors tonight. But many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Then they spit in his face and struck him. And some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if, and if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. So that's the events that unfold in what we call the Jewish trials, or what I'm calling the Jewish trials. Now, I want to do, show you one thing before we advance into uh, an examination of the actual events. A uh, picture on the screen is a diagram of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. Uh, you should be able to recognize this is the temple complex, the, the area in that red rectangle. I want, there has been an archaeological discovery, uh, I think uh, back in the 70s, of a structure that is believed to be the residence of a high priest during the time of Jesus. And that place is where the star is, essentially. It's known as the Palatial Mansion. It's called that because it is the largest private residence ever, at, that, at the time of its discovery, the largest private residence discovered in Israel. Its first floor because it was multi-story, at least two stories. First floor was 6,500 square feet, which is pretty good even for the U.S. today. That's not including the, the square footage of the second floor. And it, I, I show you that on this diagram where it's located because of its proximity to the temple. This mansion was only a 10-minute walk from the temple complex. It's less than half a mile from the temple complex. And so it's in very close proximity to the, the, the sacred area of the temple. It's here in the heart of Jerusalem, and it's this massive facility. Uh, let's see here. The, pictured on the screen, there is a, a museum. It's called the Wohl Museum, W-O-H-L Museum in Jerusalem. And this museum is built on top of a, uh, uh, an ancient section of Jerusalem known as the Herodian district. And this uh, archaeological dig, you could say, is the portion of that house. Now this image doesn't really tell you much. I mean, you can see there's this area here with steps coming down. This actually is called a small courtyard. There's two courtyards in this house. This was the small courtyard, which means that it was an open air part. But this large rectangular area up here was the bigger courtyard, an open area courtyard, that is actually attached to the entrance. The entrance would have been right through this area to, the, to the, what is the back of the screen. It was a, a, a kind of a vestibule area that took you out to the street, and you would have, you would have come into that courtyard. It is suggested, at the very least, that this could have been the house of Annas, or 
maybe even a shared house between Annas and Caiaphas, since they are related, Annas being Caiaphas's father-in-law. Um, and it's one of many houses in this whole historical section, but it is by far the largest, and it is the uh, most glamorous. Uh, here is a diagram of what that house would look like. Just to give you an idea, though, this back wall here, or which you're not even seeing the back wall, but this this, air, this courtyard, let me start with the courtyard. This courtyard that you see here would actually be right here. You can see the label, of course. And then this, this back wall would be the back of the screen on the previous. So the, the idea is that if this was the house of Annas, and this is where Jesus' trial took place, then is it possible that that courtyard, that courtyard that we can see right there, is the very courtyard where Peter denied Jesus those three times. One of the things that, they, that has been contended the most is that you see this vestibule area, that's your entry hallway. Just through this little door right here, you go into a reception hall, the largest room in the complex. And what's so very interesting to scholars is that they, they didn't have doors that close like we do on hinges and whatnot. So this is actually an open air door, if I can hold my hand still, Open air door through there, open air door through there. And so if Peter just stood in that corner right there, he could be seen from in here. Which relates to Jesus looking at Peter at the conclu at conclusion of the third denial. So even from an archaeological standpoint, the possibility of them being able to lock eyes within the confines of this structure uh, exists. And so therefore, it, uh, a lot of scholars think that lends more support to it. It's all, um, there's no specific direct evidence linking this house to the place where Jesus, den uh, Peter denied Jesus those three times, but it is uh, interesting to be able to look at a structure like this and get an idea of, of the type of facilities that would have been ex in existence at that time and uh, how it's possible for Peter to be in a courtyard and also be seen by Jesus, that sort of thing. So I show that with you. This is a, a model of that house, just to give you another idea, with this being that open-air courtyard. The room Jesus would have been would have been back in here. That's your vestibule entryway. And if Peter stood right there through the, through the, through the doors, uh, the open doors, you would have been able to see each other, that sort of thing. And I said they, did, they, they don't have doors like us. They did have doors. That's an incorrect statement on my part, but it's likely that some of those doorways may not, may not have doors on them, is what I should have said. Anyway, uh, I just want to show that to you because I like location. I like understanding the geography. I like understanding, um, getting a mental image of these events. And so I find it fascinating that what you first have is a location within a 10-minute walk of the temple, which would make sense for a high priest, right? And you have a location that can meet the other description factors of the story. So I find that very interesting. So let's now dive into the story itself. The first thing we really want to look at is the examination of Jesus by Annas. Now, first thing you've got to ask is, who's Annas? Annas was appointed high priest by the legate Quirinius in A.D. 6. But he was removed or deposed from that position by the procurator Valerius Gratus, who was Pilate's predecessor. In AD, six, in AD 15. So Annas was appointed high priest by a Roman official and then deposed from that position by another Roman official. Now you know what makes that complicated right off the bat? Is when did Rome get the authority to appoint high priest? Well, when Rome took when, Rome's power and authority over uh, the nation of Israel at this point had become so great that they, they were choosing who sat in positions of authority. Now this complicated matters because in the eyes of the Jewish people, when someone is appointed high priest, it's a lifetime appointment. At least they inferred that from one specific uh, biblical text. It's, uh, if you'll turn to Numbers chapter 35 and verse 25. Uh, at first glance, I would not have drawn the conclusion that this was a lifetime appointment there, but... Uh, once you see the text and put it in their terms, you understand it. Numbers chapter 30, 35 and verse 25 says that, uh, that someone who commits 
manslaughter and then goes to a city of refuge for protection shall live in that city until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. The idea behind this is, okay, so the high priest, when he dies, that's when something changes. And so the, uh, the inference is, oh, then that must mean the high priest is high priest until he dies. And so that's the policy that the Jewish people believe, that once you were appointed high priest, you're a high priest until you die, much like a Supreme Court justice. Lifetime appointment. And so Annas was appointed high priest in A.D. 6, but deposed in A.D. 15. Following him, five of his sons were made high priests until finally, and, and then they would get deposed. And then his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was made high priest and was high priest around the time of Jesus' death. So here's what we have. We have Annas, who was a high priest. Five of his sons followed him as high priest. Now his son-in-law is high priest. So he is the patriarch of a high priestly dynasty. And he may not be Rome's high priest right now, but in the eyes of the Jews, he never technically stopped being high priest. And so, he still retained the title in the eyes of the, the Jewish people. Much like when we have a president leave the office, we, he still gets referred to as president, even though he's not currently president. Or a general in the military. Uh, you, the, some, of the, some of that terminology still sticks around, even if they're not serving in that capacity anymore. So, in the in this context, Annas is not the current high priest. He's the former high priest who still wields great power in the Jewish community, in part because he was high priest, in part because his family has carried on a high priestly dynasty. And so Annas is the patriarch of this family, and his son-in-law is the current high priest, so he still wields a lot of power and still receives a lot of esteem. And so Annas interestingly, is the first one they bring Jesus to. And if you notice in John chapter 18 and verse 19, there's some specific things that, that Annas wants to question Jesus about. Annas questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. When we get to Caiaphas, the question is going to center around Jesus' identity. But for Annas, it was about his disciples and and his teaching. And that made me wonder, why were those topics of particular interest to him? And I came across one commentator who said um, that the question about his disciples dealt with the size of his following and the potential for, for any possible conspiracy or for any insurrection. And the question about his teaching suggests that there's a fundamental concern of Annas and other Jewish authorities that has to do with um, his theology. What's Jesus' theological stance? Where, do, where does he fit doctrinally? And it has little to do with politics. That's important to note. Because by the time we get to Pilate, the issue has changed. It's not doctrinal anymore. It's political. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But it seems that Annas is, is probing not in a uh, judicial format as much as Caiaphas will. He's trying to ascertain, like, how big of a problem is Jesus going to be for us? That seems to be kind of his line of questioning. And it's interesting because Jesus responds to Annas in a very unique way. It's verse 20 and 21 of John 18. When Annas questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching, Jesus said, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me. They know what I said. It's interesting because I think there are two things that Jesus accomplishes with his response. Number one, I think he uh, negates the high priest's developing accusation. See, when, when Jesus affirms that he has taught openly in the temples or in the synagogue, in the temple or in the synagogues, and, and he speaks points to the fact that there are people who have heard him that can verify what he said. Essentially what he's doing is he said, I'm I'm not doing this. Nothing I've said is in secret. Nothing I said is in private. I have not engaged in any sort of um, enticement or deception of people. 
everything's been out in the open. And it seems that maybe he's trying to dispel Annas from being able to accuse him of being a false prophet. To qualify, as one author said, to qualify as a false prophet, one must secretly entice or deceive the people. And the punishment for being a false prophet was death. So if you go back to Mosaic Law and you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 13, you read the first 11 verses of Deuteronomy 13, there are these instructions about if a prophet or a dreamer, a dreamer of dreams arises among you, it gives you signs or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder that tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, and you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. There is a law in Deuteronomy chapter 13 that says if you have somebody come along who is a prophet, who performs signs and wonders, and they come to pass, and then he tries to persuade you to follow a different deity, you put him to death. Now think about this from the Jewish leadership standpoint. They can't deny that Jesus has performed signs and wonders and miracles. That's happened. And, and, and Jesus has done things and said things that have come to pass. But they want to claim that he's trying to lead the people astray. That he's trying to lead the people to follow a different God because he's not teaching the same way they do. He's not aligning exactly the way they think he should be aligning with their authority. So it seems that maybe Annas was trying to set Jesus up with his line of questioning to be able to accuse him of being a false prophet because therefore they would have the grounds to execute him as they so desire. So this may be Jesus' way of dispelling the accusation that he's a false prophet. He's been accused of that before. John chapter 7 and verse 12, we're told that there was much muttering about Jesus among the people. And while some said he is a good man, others said, no, he is leading the people astray. <coughs> Same chapter, John chapter 7, verse 47, we're told that after officers failed to arrest Jesus while he was teaching in the temple during the Feast of Booths, the Pharisees said to those uh, that failed to arrest him, have you also been deceived? Which implies that Jesus' teaching was deceptive and was therefore leading the people astray. So Jesus has been accused of this before. And maybe Annas is just trying to find the grounds to execute him. And Jesus just thwarted that by saying, I haven't done anything secretly. I haven't tried to lead anybody astray. Brother Stan. Yes. 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 Absolutely. And that's my second point. <laughs> because not only is Jesus kind of negating the high priest's accusation, he's challenging the procedure, which is what Brother Stan is, is communicating to us. Uh, because Jesus' response basically was to ask the high priest for his witnesses. To say, hey, you know, 
the way this is supposed to work, I'm supposed to have some witnesses on my side too, and they're not here. That's exactly what Brother Stan was uh, communicating to us. Here's the thing, in a formal Jewish trial, the judge never asked direct questions of the accused, but rather called forth witnesses whose words determined the outcome. If two or more agreed with the charges, the verdict was sealed. But Annas is not operating under the, the, the proper channels here. And maybe he doesn't see himself as being engaged in a trial. Maybe, he's, maybe Annas thinks, I'm the guy who's here to get the information to pass off to Caiaphas, who will have the formal trial. Maybe Annas knows he's doing something deceptive here, but Jesus is, still, is essentially here calling out this procedure and saying, where's my fair trial? And we're going to find out that Jesus never had a fair trial. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, because what happens next is Annas sends Jesus to Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who is the reigning high priest. You see, Annas does this initial examination but in order for them to bring something to Pilate, it has to come from Caiaphas. It can't come from Annas. So that's why we move on to Annas. But before we go to, uh, move on to Caiaphas, but before we go to Caiaphas, we've got to deal with Peter. Because as John's gospel indicates, Peter's denial happened during this portion when Jesus is before, Peter's denial happened when Jesus was before Annas. Um, first off, notice this. Peter wasn't the only disciple there. We're told in John chapter 18 and verse 15 that Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now, we're never told that disciple's name. But in John's gospel, uh, anytime there has been a reference to a, an unnamed disciple like that, it has been the common perception for centuries that John's referring to himself. Because if you notice, John is the gospel author who loves to name names. In the story, uh, or in this narrative of the end of Jesus' life, John reveals names that no other author reveals, like the name of the servant who had his ear cut off, Malchus. Uh, so there are, there are examples in which John has been known to identify people for us that no one else identifies. But for some reason, this disciple remains unnamed by John. And it's assumed that he primarily remains unnamed because his readers know it's him. I don't want to dive too deeply into that, but uh, that's the general consensus, whether we're talking about uh, John named Annas. Nobody else identified Annas in the Gospels. Um, so that's just another example. But uh, it's generally believed that this unnamed disciple is John. But here's the interesting thing. This unnamed disciple, who we assume to be John, knows the high priest. Did you catch that? He's known by the high priest. That language of being known by the high priest denotes not just being an acquaintance, but there, there's some level of personal knowledge, some level of friendship. And that's always baffled me. Always baffled me. How is John a friend of the high priest? I want to call your attention back to something we covered, oh, two quarters ago. The idea that there's a potential family relationship between James and John, the apostles, and Jesus. And it's based on the identification of people who were at the cross, particularly women. Matthew, Mark, Matthew and Mark identify three women at the cross. John identifies four. The fourth one that John identifies, you'll see it as number one on his list in orange. That's Jesus' mother Mary. But if you look at the list, all three, all three Gospels list Mary Magdalene, which is easy to make that connection. Matthew has another Mary. Well, actually, all three lists have a second Mary, or really a third if you look at John's. But Matthew has Mary, mother of James and Joseph. Joseph. Mark has Mary, mother of James and Joseph. John has Mary, the wife of Clopas. Okay, with some reasoning, we could conclude that Clopas might just be the father of James and Joseph. And so that, that those Marys might just cancel each other out. There is this last person mentioned in Matthew as the mother of Zebedee's sons. Oh, that's John's mom, because John and James were the sons of Zebedee. So this must be James and John's mom. 
In Mark 15, we don't have that reference to Zebedee. We just have a, or the mother of Zebedee's sons. We just have a, a proper name, Salome. All right, let's just reason a little bit. Is it possible that James and John's mother is named Salome and her husband is Zebedee? Yes, that's possible. Then we get down to the John's gospel. John doesn't mention Salome. John doesn't mention Zebedee or the sons of Zebedee. He mentions Jesus' aunt. Actually, I think it's uh, uh, more specifically the sister of Jesus' mother or something like that. If we do a little bit of reasoning, is it possible that Salome is the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, and the sister of Jesus' mother, therefore making her Jesus' aunt? This isn't hard and fast. It's just a possibility. It's a possibility that James and John were Jesus' first cousins. Now, I bring this up because there's somebody else that is a relative of Jesus and often referred to as a cousin. Do you remember who that was? What was his name? Huh? John the Baptist. Do you remember who his parents were? And Zechariah. Do you remember what Zechariah's profession was? Priest. Now, we don't know if um, Elizabeth, we, we don't know the exact relationship between Elizabeth and Mary. But think about this. If Mary and James and John's mother are sisters, then isn't it likely, if not definitive, that John the Baptist's parents are relatives of John and James's family too? Which means that all of them might have connections to the priesthood because of John the Baptist's dad. So maybe the Apostle John knows Caiaphas through this connection to John the Baptist's dad. Okay, that's a lot of conjecture and speculation. I concede that already. But it is a possibility. And so I share that because I've always been surprised that John the Apostle is friends with Caiaphas, and it comes out in this part of the story. And, and it's always fascinated me because Peter is terrified of being identified as a disciple. Why isn't John terrified of that? John was known to the servant girl and let in the house without any condition. John was able to go into the room where Jesus was on trial. Why was John not scared to be there like Peter was? It's because he knows the high priest. Peter doesn't. It might just be that John was family. He didn't have to be scared. But Peter wasn't. So I, I think that's worth exploring at the very least and considering the possibilities that are here. I want to turn our attention now to Peter. And I actually want to turn our attention to what appears to be a discrepancy between the four Gospels in regards to Peter's denial. Think for a moment, based on each Gospel, who recognized Peter? On the three times he denied his relationship with Jesus, who was it that pointed out that he was a disciple? So in Matthew's Gospel, Peter is first recognized by a servant girl, then another servant girl, and finally by bystanders who recognized his accent. There's the references if you want to look those up. That's the three in Matthew's gospel. Mark's gospel is not too different. According to Mark, Peter was first recognized by one of the servant girls, again by the same servant girl, so not a different servant girl like Matthew, and then finally by bystanders who identified him as a Galilean. Not so much identifying his accent specifically, but just identified him as a Galilean, which probably meant they did know the accent. Luke says that Peter is first recognized by a servant girl, still consistent, but then by someone else who was a man. Matthew and Mark said it was a girl. Luke says it's a man. And finally, uh, Luke says that third time, it's another who was also a man, so a second man, not a group of bystanders, but a second man. And, he, and this this individual once again identified Peter as a Galilean. Now we go to John's gospel. According to John, Peter was first recognized by a servant girl, so consistent, then by the servants and officers who were warming themselves next to Peter, and then finally by one of the servants of the high priest who was a relative of Malchus, essentially. And 
this individual identified Peter as having been present in the garden. Not that he was from Galilee, but that he was present at the arrest. So there are some differences between these Gospels. And I've done this a couple of times in this series. How do we reconcile the differences? Because this is one way people like to attack Scripture. Well, here's how we reconcile. I I really did this with the feeding of the 5,000. The thing you have to recognize is that these events were passed on orally for a really long time before they were ever written down. And so, as you know, whenever you're telling people about the fish you caught, the story kind of changes over time. And the fish was this big, but this big, this big. The, the details are what matter. If you follow these four accounts of Peter's denial, the major details always remain the same. The minor details change. Let me show you what I mean. All four Gospels agree that the first recognition was by a servant girl. The Gospels agree on the major detail of who recognized Peter first. All four. The Gospels agree on the major detail of a second recognition of Peter by a servant, but differ on the minor detail of who and when. So let me, oh, let me go back. Let me explain that one. In three of the four accounts, we're talking Matthew, Mark, and John, a second recognition of Peter is attributed to a servant. Luke simply has the phrase, someone else. That easily harmonizes with an individual servant. It doesn't exclude an individual servant, is what I mean. Now, Matthew indicates that this was a second servant girl. John indicates that this was a second servant who was a man. And Mark indicates that this was the same servant as the first. Those are minor details, but they all agree it was a servant. And when Matthew and Mark, they place this recognition by a servant second, but John places it as the third recognition of Peter. So the order chronologically differs between the three. And whether this was a male or female differs between the three. Whether this is the original servant girl or a different servant girl varies. Those minor details change, but the major detail that a second recognition of Peter involved a servant that remains the same. A third thing that is the same is that the Gospels agree on the major detail of there being a third recognition of Peter by a group, not just an individual. In three of the four accounts, we're talking Matthew, Mark, and John, Peter, Peter's recognition is attributed to a group. Luke has Luke's phrase of another easily harmonizes if you assume Luke is simply referring to the individual from amongst the group who verbalized the accusation. Luke doesn't mention it as a group per se, but in that group, someone has to be the one who says the words, that's Peter. And maybe Luke's just referring to that individual. But here's where the big difference, the, the, the bigger difference occurs between the three, and that's in the chronological placement, because Matthew and Mark and Luke place this recognition third, while John places it second. So the major detail that a group notices Peter, that occurs in all of them to some degree with some minor variations. And finally, the Gospels agree on the major detail that the third recognition of Peter cited evidence of Peter's identification. They differ on what that identification is. The minor detail of was it his accent? Was it just the fact that he's from Galilee? Was it the fact that he was in the garden? That differs. But the major detail of there is some sort of evidence attributed to his recognition is cited in all four. So my point is this. When you peel back the layers and go, what's the major consistency and what are the minor inconsistencies? You can find a harmony that exists because in all the gospel accounts, little details change. Because even if, you, if we sat down and we witnessed the same event and tried to retell that event later, there's going to be minor differences. Because what I observe, I'm going to focus on certain things that you're not going to focus on, and you're going to focus on certain things that I'm not going to focus on. And we're going to interpret things a little differently. We're going to remember things a little differently. So you look for the things that are consistent, and you, and you, can, you can find that the major detail remains the same, but the minor details 
vary. So I wanted to show that because it's helpful when, when we're dealing with the apologetical side of defending Scripture. Now, how did Peter respond when people recognized him? After the first a- accusation, Peter simply denied it and in effect said, I don't know what you're talking about. This is the, the least threatening of the three confrontations because it's directed to Peter, not to those around him. It's just the servant girl and Peter, apparently. After the second accusation, Matthew indicates that Peter denied it with an oath and said, I do not know the man. The use of the oath is an invocation of something sacred, whether it's the name of God or, or something like that, to affirm the truthfulness of the statement. When you, when you employ an oath, what you're saying is, is, I swear by this that I'm telling the truth. It should be noted that Jesus warned in the Sermon on the Mount about invoking these kinds of oaths, since they are often attempts to hide one's deception. Huh, Peter, did you forget that part of the Sermon on the Mount? Apparently. It's also worth mentioning that when the high priest attempted to put Jesus under oath, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64, he says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ. That's the high priest putting Jesus under oath. Jesus evaded it by responding, you have said so. Jesus never conceded to the oath. It's not that Jesus was trying to avoid giving his identity, but he was trying to avoid taking the oath. It's also worth pointing out that Peter refused to refer to Jesus by name. Interestingly, the disciple who earlier proclaimed the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, here simply referred to him as the man. And then the third accusation comes along, and Matthew and Mark indicate that Peter began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. To invoke a curse is to ask God to punish oneself or another if what is being said is not the truth. And such was a common practice among Israelites to prove the veracity of their statement. Ruth invoked a curse on herself after telling Naomi, where you go, I will go, and your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Ruth said, may the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. She was invoking a curse. Eli invoked a curse on Samuel, After that night when the Lord spoke to Samuel, Eli asked him what the Lord had told him, but Samuel was afraid to tell him because it was bad news for Eli. And so to get Samuel to tell him, Eli said this in 1 Samuel 3, verse 17, May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So we see curses used in Scripture elsewhere, and that's what Peter's doing. Whether he's referring to God punishing him or punishing the people present, it doesn't matter. Peter is invoking this curse to prove that he's telling the truth. And after Peter's denial, the one key thing that really stands out to me is that Jesus locked eyes with him. And that's when Peter remembered the prophecy about the rooster crowing. He went outside and wept bitterly. From there, the, tr- the story transitions to Caiaphas. Oop, I missed a slide. Oh, well. I, I did not insert a slide, I should say. Think about who's present at the part of this trial where, where Caiaphas is involved. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 57 says that Those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. That's interesting. When he appears before Caiaphas, and and let me also point this out, they may may not have even had to go to a different house. Or maybe they went next door. Who knows? But he appears before Caiaphas, and there are other members of the Sanhedrin present. Caiaphas was kind of like the, uh, he's the one who presided over the Sanhedrin. We talked about them several weeks ago. The Sanhedrin's made up of 70 men, 70 Jewish men, who come from one of three groups. The scribes, who were the, the religious experts, the teachers of Mosaic Law. They also came from the elders of the people. That's the kind of the political leaders. That's the heads of the families and the tribes and that sort of thing. 
And then finally they came from the priests, chief priests, I should say. That's a reference in this case to people who were former high priests, part, members of the high priestly family, people who, who were the elite of the elite among the priests. So you kind of have this aristocracy almost that make up the, the uh, Sanhedrin. You have the, the most educated in the scribes. You have the political leaders in the elders. And you have the uh, uh, people of select, selected positions, being the chief priests, of uh, special um, religious positioning among them. And it's interesting because this group has gathered with Caiaphas. But here's the thing about this group. They did have something known as a quorum. You're familiar with a quorum. It's the minimum number of people necessary to make a decision. In most organizations today, what usually makes up a quorum? What percentage do you think makes up a quorum? At least. Uh, some organizations make it much higher, like 70% or something like that. I mean, even in Congress, you've got to have a quorum to pass a law. Here's what's interesting. Sanhedrin is made up of 70 men. Want to take a guess at what made a quorum? Anybody know? 23. One third, basically. Do you think Caiaphas can get 23 buddies to his house to hear this out, to be the quorum? You remember, there are two guys we know of who became disciples who were members of the Sanhedrin. What are their names? One of them Jesus met in John chapter 3, talked about being born again. Nicodemus, the other one oversaw his burial. Joseph of Arimathea, now Nicodemus was there to help him. Those two became disciples, according to Scripture, and they were members of the Sanhedrin. One thing we're told about Joseph of Arimathea in particular is that Joseph, let me find my text here, Joseph did not consent. Joseph, this is Luke chapter 23, verse 51, Joseph of Arimathea, he had not consented to their decision and action, referring to the Sanhedrin's decision. It's most likely that he wasn't invited to the party that night, that he's one of the uh, near 50 that were left out, that, that could have been left out, I should say. A quorum of 23 out of 70, that's ridiculous. But that was, um, from, that, that was Jewish policy at the time. And so Jesus may not have that big of a group there, but there was probably enough to make this official to some degree. But that doesn't mean that it was legal. See, what's interesting about Jesus' trial is that according to Jewish laws, everything about it was illegal. I'm going to reference what's called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is, Mishnah was compiled in about 200 A.D., so about 200 years after Jesus. Uh, it was a comp compilation of the oral traditions, the oral commentary, if you will, on Mosaic Law, what the rabbis for generations had taught as the interpretation of Mosaic Law. It but the Mishnah in the eyes of the Jewish people, carried nearly as much weight as Mosaic Law because it's the explanation of the law by the learned rabbis of the generations past. And so what's written in the Mishnah typically de describes the, the traditional practices and, and interpretations of Scripture. So here are some things that the Mishnah says about such a trial. For one, this trial was illegal because it occurred at night. According to Mishnah Sanhedrin 4.1, uh, a capital case like this, capital being one that involves the possibility of executing the criminal, a capital case uh, must be held during the daytime, and the verdict must also be reached during the daytime. Another thing that made this illegal is that the verdict in a capital case could not be reached until the second day. And therefore, trials could not be held on the eve of the Sabbath or a feast day. Anybody know what day it was? Remember? It's Passover. Regardless of which traditional or um, alternative timeline you go with, Passover is the first day of what feast? 
Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's a seven-day feast. The whole time it's holy. If this does occur on a Friday, guess what the next day is, the Sabbath day. No matter how you look at this, they weren't supposed to be meeting because the day that follows required a Sabbath. Mission of 4.1 in Mission of Sanhedrin 4.1 in, non oh, wait. in capital cases, a verdict of acquittal may be reached on the same day, but a verdict of conviction not until the following day. Therefore, trials may not be held on the eve of a Sabbath or on the eve of a festival. I'm quoting from Jewish documents right there. A third reason this was illegal is because Jesus' trial began with for conviction instead of reasons for acquittal. Mishnah 4.1, Mishnah Sanhedrin 4.1 says, um, in capital cases, begin with reasons for acquittal and do not begin with reasons for conviction. They started by talking about the reasons Jesus should be found guilty. They did not start with reasons he should be found innocent. That was against their policies too. Also, we've kind of talked about this, uh, well, we've already talked about the witness factor, but in particular, witnesses had to be warned to relate only true firsthand testimony. Mishnah Sanhedrin 4.5. How did they admonish witnesses in capital cases? They brought them in and admonished them, saying, perhaps you will say something that is only a supposition or hearsay or secondhand or even from a trustworthy man. Or perhaps you do not know that we shall check you with examination and inquiry. Know, moreover, that capital cases are not like non-capital cases. In non-capital cases, a man may pay money and so make atonement. But in capital cases, the, witnesses, the witness is answerable for the blood of him that is wrongfully condemned and the blood of his descendants that should have been born to him to the end of the world. In other words, in a capital case like Jesus is facing, the witnesses are supposed to be as honest as possible, and those who have the man on trial are going to investigate the truth and, uh, the, and the, uh, the, the, tr well, the truthfulness of their accusations because it could lead to the death of someone. They didn't do that. I, I know that's our final bill. Let me give you two more real quick. Another reason Jesus' trial was uh, illegal is because those accused of blasphemy could be convicted only if they reviled the divine name. Mishnah Sanhedrin 7.5 specifically says the blasphemer is punished only if he utters the name of God. Technically, Jesus didn't do that. At least not in the accusations that are presented in the trial. There are other times, I mean, you, you could say Jesus did that when he did the I am statements. I and the Father are one, things like that. It, it borders on it. But in the trial, Jesus never technically did that. Not that he wasn't willing to. It's just the accusations did not bring that out. Finally, number six, Jesus' trial should have been conducted in the chamber of Hewn Stone where the great court assembled rather than in the high priest's house. Here's the thing. Mission of Sanhedrin 11.2 says three courts of law were there. One situated at the entrance to the Temple Mount, another at the door of the Temple Court, and the third in the Chamber of Hewn Stone. This same passage then refers to the Chamber of Hewn Stone as the Great Court, from whence instruction issued to all Israel. Here's the point. They had a council chamber that they were supposed to do this in, but instead of doing it in the council chamber, they're doing it in the high priest's house. That was wrong. We'll carry this thought into next week as well and, and, and show how this uh, issue continued into the next day with the Sanhedrin. Um, and we'll finish talking about the, the, the trials uh, with the Jews and then transition into the Roman trials next week. Thank you for your time and attention. We'll be dismissed.